God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God. May God fill you with truth and joy. Let us pray. O God, in your Son, Jesus Christ, you richly bless us with all that we need, bread from the earth and the bread of heaven, which gives life into the world. Grant us one thing more, grateful hearts to sing your praise in this world and the world to come. Amen. Meet the Most Reverend Mark D. Manning, Bishop of Dallas Universal Life Church in Dallas, Texas. More commonly, he is referred to as Bishop Mark. Cornerstone of his teaching stems from his alma mater at Jesuit Dallas, where the motto still stands today, and for others. This combined with the standoff approach to one's belief stating to do which is right, which makes for an unorthodox, less controlling type of church, and a church that is dedicated to helping its congregants communicate through prayer, and a dialogue with God while showing them ways to stay on their path. Yes, idle minds are the playthings of the devil. That is why it is important for us to keep our focus on our destination and not be sidetracked. Moses intervened on behalf of the people and God had a change of heart. Centuries later, Jesus Christ would intercede on our behalf, restoring our relationship with God. Amen. Amen. But as sure as I'm standing here today, I know that the path that he laid for you then is waiting for you now. All you have to do is open your eyes to see. Do that which is right. Yes, it's that simple. Dallas Universal Life Church officially came into being on May 31st, 2016. The first service was held on Christmas night, December 25th, 2016, and continued every Sunday afterwards. And it's easy to get caught up in the hustle and bustle of Black Friday. And it seems like Black Friday is actually closer to Christmas than anything nowadays, because at Halloween we've got uh, Christmas music. And don't get me wrong. It's wonderful that we're celebrating so early, but the problem is we're not celebrating the right things. But the path that God is leading us on is not the path of, I want, what did you get me? I want more. How do I get that? It's not about I. It's about others. Because we strive to be men for others. And I think that if we remember that, especially around Christmas, it's not about the giving. It's about the gifting. God gave us the Son, asking for nothing in return. In fact, gave us His Son to forgive our own sins of his love and his kindness and his unbelievable forgiveness of us. And if you've ever given a gift and truly given it and not expected anything in return, that feeling you get when that person's eyes light up, you if you feel that sense of, not accomplishment, but sense of something, doing something right, giving without reason, without, without expectation, which is what all gifts should be. We give without expecting to receive something in return. On April 2nd, a milestone for the church was announced. I want an announcement to make before we move on. Kind of a big one. Uh, we had a very long way for this little piece of mail right here. And, um, I'm very happy to say that the IRS has granted us our 501c3 status. So it's official, we're now a real church in the eyes of the government. So yeah, please. We come together as brothers and sisters to celebrate what the Lord has done for us. We ought to tell how good God has been to us personally. We should witness that God is wonderful, that he has taken us from a state of nothingness and allowed us the privilege of making a significant contribution to the betterment of humankind. The church ought to be an area of joyous celebration every time the doors open. Bishop Mark's approach to leading his flock is often viewed on the surface as moderately traditional in those times. But stay after the service for his roundtable discussion, or go behind the scenes as he speaks openly and unscripted about his beliefs and the values his church upholds, and traditional wouldn't be a way to describe him. 
or the theology of his church. <laughs> seriously, I mean, seriously, um, what would it take for you to stand up and say, look, I believe that God loves me unconditionally and that he has this place for me, a beautiful home, even after this life. Mm -hmm. What would it take for you to believe that? But I, I mean, I, I, I believe it to an extent, but not 100%. You know. So you're not, I mean, the doubt is very normal. It's very normal for, for any... Even Mother community. Teresa says she, ne she never really felt um, God in her life. Okay. She said, she said, but she was a beautiful, wonderful woman who lived on what? Mm -hmm. who, who lived her life by what? What, is she, what was her basis? Mm -hmm. Her faith. Mm -hmm. And what is faith? What is faith? What's the definition of faith? Uh, believing in without any proof. That's exactly right. Believing in something without proof. So, why do we have to... Why is that important? Why? We're, God created us to, to want answers. Mm -hmm. Our brains that we have to see things. We, we create scientific answers, you know, chemistry, well, even our languages all have rules and answers, and this is the way it's supposed to be. Yet when it comes to, to God, He says, you got to just believe me. you got to just trust me. Look, I created you. Just believe me. Yeah. Why, would I, why would I relate you, lead you astray? And we have to look around and go, yeah, it's a pretty nice place He gave us. And if he didn't really care for us, he probably wouldn't have given us this. He probably wouldn't you know, be torturing us, you know, you know, whatever, something else. He wouldn't give us happiness. Mm -hmm. can, you imagine, can you imagine life without happiness? Yeah. I'm talking a lot. We'd be pretty dull because what, without, without happiness comes what? No yeah. sadness. Mm -hmm. Without sadness. Without happiness. Without love, there is no missing it. Mm -hmm. Without joy, there is no pain. So what are we? We're robots. Does everyone live your life? Or do you want to believe? Bishop Mark's addition to his traditional service is what he calls the round table, which takes place after the standard dismissal. Those who wish can stick around and discuss the service, Christianity, or anything else that pertains to following that path that God has laid for them. Bishop Mark describes this session as a crucial part of the service, not only for the congregants who gain a better understanding of their faith and are able to often work through some difficult life lessons together, but also for himself because he gets the feedback he needs to know if he's leading them properly, teaching them how to follow that path, if they're getting it or not. Um, talk to me, what do you think? Nothing today, Gavin? Come on, you're always the gift, gift of gab over there. I know the gift of gab. I know. Well, let's see. i got to say one thing that I do love the sermon. And I love the contrast of how we can choose between power and might versus the spiritual world, which is everlasting. And... Um, but what's everlasting in the spiritual world? What's the difference? I mean, everlasting just means the time, time frame. What is it? What's the difference between what's we got spirit? We got the we got the might here, the, the power and the might here that that on our earth, the earthly power. Earthly what, power what do we have? What do we have in that other kingdom that's so different? Eternal power, eternal love, eternal grace. Um, there's just so much more. Like it's ridiculous because, quite frankly, one of the things that I absolutely love about the contrast is the fact that yeah, there's earthly might, yeah, there's or free power, but all things fade in time. And this, especially on the earth, that's just how it goes. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the spiritual world, nothing fades. It's eternal, forever. And about the Almighty Father who created us. For, I believe he said it quite eloquently, from dust you were made, into dust you shall return. Yeah, going right back to what? Ash Wednesday when we started with Yeah. And we're in culture. The roots of Ash Wednesday go all the way back to the story of Adam and Eve and God's response to their disobedience in the Garden of Eden. Before banishing them from the Garden, God tells them what the consequences of their sin are. Because of your disobedience, you will work your whole life to provide food from the earth. And when your life is over, you will return to the ground from which you came. For you were made of dust, and to dust you shall return. Genesis chapter 3 verse 19. Those are the traditional words spoken to us on Ash Wednesday as we receive the mark of ash on our bodies. Remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. Over the centuries this day has stood as a deliberate reminder of our mortality. A reminder that we are not God and that despite our best plans and efforts all that we have and are will finally come to dust. 
God knows how we were made. God remembers that we are but dust. Our days on earth are like grass, like wildflowers, <coughs> bloom and die. The wind blows and we are gone, as though we had never been here. Psalm 103. Okay. Tim, what's bothering you? Yeah, you can. What is it? Well, I, I mean, first thing is I was thinking about my mother a lot. Okay. It's common. Tim, Tim lost his mother. Um, she passed away. How long was it in October of last year. This was still pretty fresh. And she, she loved Easter. Yeah. My mom did too. So. It's I think it's hardest for a young man to lose his mother, and, and the opposite is it's hardest for a young woman to lose their mother or, or their father. It's just the way things work. And I, and I believe me, I'm right there with you, man. I, I miss my mother very, very much. But Easter's about new life. It's about resurrection. It's about re, reborn, reborn, being reborn, and our faith tells us that she and with my mother and everybody else is in a much better place and hopefully watching over us and yeah I'll be all right i know you'll be all right reading is good she's smiling yeah she'll show you something especially the easter was her holiday there'll be something that was special to her that you'll notice it's out of the corner of your eye and that will give you the biggest smile see my mother doesn't do that my mother just throws things at me <laughs> <laughs> i told you that story i told you that story about her knocking everything off the wall taking the nails out of the wall and everything yeah. <laughs> or about when i on my birthday one year in this house my first birthday here she i'm looking at my phone it's like 12 15 my birthday it just become my birthday i'm sitting there by myself and the phone goes black and it says m o m on the phone wow. scary <laughs> My mother never did anything half-assed, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> you want to make sure I knew what she was saying. <laughs> so, but you'll think those moments would get you down, but they don't. They, they lift you up. It scared the shit out of me at first, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> That's what it did. It scared yeah. me. It really did. It scared the bejesus out of me. But I, mean, like, I actually threw the phone. Me. I threw the phone across the room. But you know, after that, I realized, hey, you know, she's just trying to say, you know, she's probably been trying forever to... to... Hello, Martin. Hey, I'm over here. Hey. And it didn't work. Right? Yeah. I'm so, you know, I'm not paying attention. So open your eyes, open your heart. Your mother's still here. She's still in your heart. She's still with you, okay? All right? It's all good. Celebrate Easter as if she were here with you, because she is. Oh. The fact that life is a mystery and we shall never fully understand it. At these moments, we are astonished. We are astonished at the gift of life, at the reality of life, and even more, Astonished to God. We are astonished that in giving life, God also gives the freedom to do with it as we will, to use it or abuse it, to invest it or waste it, to live it through to the fullest or to cut it short. We need to understand that life in this world, in this earth, and in this body is not forever. It is a brief and temporary moment in time. We are not permanent residents of this place. We are transients who come and go. When we live, we live for God. When we die, we know that It'll we will be in God's presence in death, in heaven, for eternity, God right? Loves so whether we live, whether we death. live or whether we die, we are God's. We belong to Him, right? Yes. It's not fair. Why? We do. He gave us free will. Yes. He gave us that will. To do whatever we want to do with it. We can choose to honor the person who gave us life. He's not asking much though. He does. No, how? how? Like to worship him a day of the a day of the week? Oh no, no, but worship him is fine. He created you. So the, oh, I created the phone. I will make it. He breathed life into your body, which nobody, nothing else. My mom has been did to do. that. No, she didn't. No, she didn't. <laughs> God gave her the ability to assist in your creation. Yes. Ultimately, you were created in His image. Yes. I, just, I understand that. I just, I'm just like, I know. I get it. I get I what just, you're saying. I just understand, like, you know, like I, when I think of worship, I think of like uh, some type of like uh, person like making. You, but is he not? No, no. If he wanted to make us be that way, he would make us all drones and not give us free will and say, <coughs> "Worship me." Um, yeah, so yeah, bow down. Bow down. 
It's not what he's asking for. It's not what he's asking for. It's not like he's ever around. We, he's really not asking for anything. But we owe him. Don't you think you owe to your creator, the one who breathed life into you, who really thought you up and built you with his own two hands? Don't you think you owe him with a bit of gratitude? And do you owe him for the things that he's offered you here on earth? The things that he's freely given you? I mean, life mm -hmm. and food and, and, and water and parents and friends and love and happiness? Don't yeah. you think that that deserves? Well, like when he shows up, I'll, I'll come. I'll, I'll, I'll work he's here. And we, when he shows up physically, uh, we can't very well go and come over. Times get bad. Hey, as for health. Over now. Hey, just right in front of you. <laughs> he's in him. And he's in him. And he's in me. And he's in him. And he's in me, you know? and he's in him. Did you know? So how can we go to God when we're hurting, when we're needing, when we're wanting, when we desperately need his help and ask him for anything when we can't give him a little bit of... Is that why there's like so much suffering in the world? Maybe. Because he's like... He, like he's there's suffering, suffering in the world because there's joy in the world. And you have to have both. You cannot appreciate the true meaning of joy without knowing the true meaning of suffering. Many of us have a mushy kind of faith that says, everything's all right, Jesus loves me, this I know. It doesn't matter what I do with my life. I can go ahead living for myself as if I'm the only one on earth that matters. If getting to heaven were based on merit, maybe Mother Teresa might make it and a few others. But you and I, we would be on the outside looking in. Our admittance to the select company will not be based on merit, but on God's unconditional love for us. Be Christian speaking, what does the Bible say your purpose is on this earth? To worship God. To serve and worship God. How could you do any better in life than to do those things? What does that have to do with your legacy? Nothing. There's an eternal bit. legacy. Yeah. What it means is a true legacy would be met if you did do those things. If you did truly serve and worship God unselfishly, without desire, without wanting anything in return, just because you love God and you're grateful for His gifts that he gave you, mm -hmm. and he continues to give you every single day, every single second of each breath you take. The idolatry of faith is when we begin to use the story and belief of God to judge and separate others. This is when we carve in stone the stories of our tradition as reality to such a level that we lose sight that they are a chronicle of people's encounters with the God of love and turn the activity of faith into the judgment seat of faith separating those who are in in and those who are out. The idolatry of faith is broken by true faith, which is trust. Trust the stories and traditions about God. They are not God themselves, but instead urge us into the true faith, pointing to God. Teaching what he calls the right way to pray is another of Bishop Mark's stress philosophies. Pray, like most people don't pray, because when people pray today, they get on their knees and they pray and they ask for their whatever they want or they need uh, from God and tell them, you know, what, what maybe maybe a little confession, telling them what we've done wrong, and then they get up and they walk away. And God was getting ready to say something back to them. The whole idea of prayer is it's a conversation. It's not a it's not a it's not a monologue. It's a conversation between you and God. And God will lead you on the right path. He, he laid that path for you when you were born. He's all, every one of us has a different one. I, as a pastor, can only guide you based on what God has shown me and what, what I've learned in my life. And um, for the good and the bad, I've, I've had my trials, I've had my tribulations, I've had the good and the bad, I've had the, the happiness and the sad, and they've all helped me to become the guide, if you will, that I am today, which is all that I look at myself as. I'm not a mentor, I'm not a, you know, a holy leader or somebody to follow necessarily, but I'm just a God. I'm just here to help you stay on your path, wherever that may lead you. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. grace and peace to you from God. May God you. Men for others. And I, I, I think that that is such an important thing to live and if we do that every day just remember that you're not living this for yourself do something for others don't do it for yourself it will all come back to you it will be provided to you give to others and it will come back mm -hmm. you will have no need to have to worry about things and it's hard to, to, to put that faith in, in God and in, 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 
and that particular statement of if I do for others, I will also receive them. It works though. Do for others, and you will get in return. That's a huge thing for me. Yeah, that's that's a that's a base. That's a a cornerstone of our of our church, if you will. By continually choosing to be men and women for others, every second of every day of our lives, we can then begin to understand what unconditional love really is. You see, it's not about the accolades or the prestige or the fame. It's about leading through example with a life that we can be proud of, unselfish, non-judging, humble, honest. I, religion has gotten such a bad name, you know, uh, because humanity is involved in it. You're going to have corruption. You're going to have um, mistakes. You have all sorts of things that that can happen with, with, with imperfect humans. And God knows that. But sometimes I think we don't. And we look at this book that's been created with human hands, although divinely inspired, still created with human hands. And we sometimes take it a little too far. I think we have to remember that Yes, God breathed life into this book, but there's a lot of gone through a lot of hands since then. And although I believe fantastic learning lessons of life, fantastic ways to stay on your path to your God, fantastic ways to learn from others' mistakes in the past, you also have to take it with a grain of salt. And you have to learn that interpretations are wrong at times, and that pages are missing. And I think if you just learn to, like I said in the beginning, pray the right way, the book becomes a study guide where you can talk to God face to face, right from the man, telephone to telephone, ear to ear, and you don't need a book. All you have to do is listen. If people would just shut up and listen, just shut up and listen, the world would be so much better. And here I go talking and talking and talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's Please rise. As Christ teaches us, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Prayer is not a monologue. Prayer is a conversation between you and God. So say what you have to say, then shut up and listen. When's the last time you actually prayed? And before you got off your knees, you closed your mouth, cleared your mind, and listened to what he said back. How many people learned how to pray this Lent? How many people learned how to sit and pray? Is anybody doing that like we talked about? Is anybody practicing that? Mm -hmm. I'll let thy will be done. And, yeah. what, else, what else though we talked about, Gavin? What else we talked about about how, how to pray? There's something very, very important that we all don't do. We all listen. mess it up. We listen for the response. You listen. You know, we all sit there and, hey God, I need this, 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 and I need this, 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 and feel this, and feel that, and do this, and do better, and give me all the money in the world, and then you get up and walk away. And God's standing there with his mouth open because he's about to say something to you, but you turned your back on him and walked out the door. Prayer is not a monologue. Prayer is a conversation between you and God. Yes, you're hearing voices. You're supposed to listen to them. He's going to help you stay on your path. If you're schizophrenic, go get some medicine. <laughs> you know his voice when you hear it. It's different for all of us. It doesn't, it's not really a sound. It's a, a breath. It's a feel heartbeat. I feel like it's a feeling. It's a fleeting moment. Prayer is not a conversation. Or prayer is not a, a monologue. Yes. Prayer is not a monologue. 
In other words, when you get down on your knees and you pray and you say what you want to say and you ask for whatever you want to ask for, when you get up and walk away, you can just pray. All you do is talk. Mm -hmm. okay? Prayer is a conversation between you and God. And if you're done talking to Him, don't get up and walk away because I think it's kind of rude. You need to listen because He's ready to talk back. So you clear your mind and shut your mouth and listen. And believe me, if you listen, you will not only hear Him, you will feel Him. It's not the voices in your head this time, it's, it's God speaking to you. And that is the fundamental teaching that I think that so many of us miss, is that how to pray. How do you pray? Right? If Jesus I was gonna say, could it be your your, your inner voice that that that's the right. way that God? That inner voice, that 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 thing I'm always talking about about praying, and uh, most people don't pray. They don't. They just don't do it. They're talking. You know. I mean, how many times do I have to say it? Prayer is a conversation, not a monologue. That's correct. Prayer is not a monologue. It's a conversation between you and God. And if you just get down on your knees and you say, "I want this, that, and the other," and please give me this, please give me that, and pray and bless this person and body die, and then get up and walk away. What have you done? You just left God standing there with his feet. He's just he's ready to talk to you and say something and you just walked away. So you missed the whole point. You ask him for these things and he's going to tell you how to get them, how to get the things that you need in your life, not necessarily that you want, that you need. Right? Um, we, we believe that all are welcome, all are welcome to communion. And Jesus Christ didn't put stipulations on that. As always, we celebrate communion in the way of Jesus Christ. All are welcome to share in this celebration. No, no one is excluded. excluded. We humbly thank our Lord Jesus Christ for this gift that we share today and pray for and strengthen our bonds as Christian men, as men and women, for others. Amen. Amen. Bishop Mark is adamant in offering communion to anyone and everyone who wants it church member or not, Christian or not, reminding at every service that this is the way that Christ offered communion, without stipulations or requirements. Unlike the belief of the Roman Catholic roots, Bishop Mark and his congregation don't believe the bread and wine are actually the body and blood of Christ, but are a holy symbol or representation that we remember the sacrifice that Christ made for us. something I don't normally see in a church, and I kind of think it's something that's missing. And that's the chance that y'all get to talk to me. Because I've talked at you, and hopefully helped you catch a little something, but the last hour or so, so now it's your turn to give me a little feedback. And it helps me because we are a new church, as you can tell. We just started our first service with Christmas of last year. So we've had our ups and downs and our ins and outs, and, and uh, and there's been days that I've done the service by myself, but it still gets done. It's always happens here on Sunday. Um, so what I always ask is, what do you got for me? What do you think? What did you like? What did you not like? What would you include? What would you take out? Um, is there anything that you thought was particularly wonderful that moved you? Is there anything that you just, just absolutely hated that you want me to get rid of? So think about it for a second. Feel free to speak to me. This is completely candid and open. You're not going to hurt my feelings. This is all about trying to make things better. I was awestruck and breast it took my breath away and I think you should probably get a box of Kleenex because I actually got tears came to my eyes and that's when I used the restroom and got tissue. So what part what part what part brought the tears to you? Before you came out, mm -hmm. just the setting and mm -hmm. the the smell of the room and memories? Well, not really memories. This is a new New thing, thing for you, huh? This is new I mean it was just like official, you know, it was mm -hmm. like Good. It's officially in my home, it is, um, but you know, it is what we have right now. Um, we, we were just granted our 501c3 status last week, which has been a battle. I'm telling you, that they don't make it easy for churches to exist and to get that, that certification. So in, in, the, in the eyes of the uh, United States government, we are a church. Um, so until that happened, we couldn't even begin to look for a place to, to have uh, our own building or for a place of worship. So. This was the best we could do, and, and, and it, it is what it is, and I, I'm, I'm glad to open my home up, and I'm, I hope that we can fill it up, and it's the standing room only. I mean, I love the fact that y'all are all here. I think it's, it's, it's a huge boost for me. Um, but it is still my home, and it is, I try and make it as official as possible in here. I try and make it feel as comfortable and more like a, a church setting, but at least these, these couches move right back into place, and we have a, a nice little living room in a little while. So 
but I, I want something that's a little more permanent, and we're working towards that, and hopefully, um, uh, soon, we will find something that's in All right, let's talk about this. What did you like? What did you not like? What do you want to keep? What do you want to get rid of? What did you get out of the server day? Let's talk about anything you want to talk about about today, and about a server, and about a service, and, and go from there. Let's, uh, just tell me what you think. I like them all. Well, I mean, it's the truth. I mean, I can sit here and, and BS you all day long, right? I can talk, I can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and not do anything. I mean, I can say whatever I want to say. I can be, you know, I mean, it's about doing. It's about action. It's about putting your money where your mouth is, if, you, if, if, if that's what you're saying. I mean, it's always about money, but that's just a yeah. way of saying it. And you got to put your energy into it, not just into your words. Your words are great, but um, if, if your words don't, have anything to back them up, they're really nothing. Sure that. I mean, you're nothing more than your word. I mean, your word is is, is you. I mean, that's, if you say you're going to do something, you need to do it. Yeah. And if you're not going to, if, you're not, if you get that reputation of being the one who says he does it and it never does, well, that, that pretty much sucks. And it's not what you want to be. God treats all of us in an, individual, in an individualistic way. God knows us all better than we know ourselves and ever will. You should also do the same with yourself and with your God. You should know yourself better than anybody else knows you. And so many, so many of us don't because we, what do we do? We just hide from ourselves. We just don't want to feel with it. We don't trust it. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to do it. We don't want to talk about it. We just, just numb it out. Right? Numb it out. Mm -hmm. The clouds have to rise sometime. Mm -hmm. The fog's got to lift. And then what are you going to be? You're going to be standing tonight to know who you are. Who you're standing with, with who you're, who this being is that you're there, that you're, who are you? I don't know. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I believe in. I don't know what I stand for. Mm -hmm. Moses did. You have to stand for something. Moses stood up to God. Moses stood up to God and had him change his mind. You talk about choosing your path. Yes, we choose our paths. We choose. Do we choose the one that God laid out for us? God designed exclusively for each of us. Usually, we do. I think for the most part. I think a lot of times we do stray from that though. And it's very easy to get off that path and lose sight of where we're going. You've got to keep that sight on that final goal, which is what? What's that final goal that we're talking about? Where's that goal taking us to? Heaven. Heaven. Yeah. Everlasting life. Promise of. Promise of eternal life. Of love. God's eternal grace. love. Nothing but. Just when we, when we use our own will instead of God's will, we get in trouble. God gave us free will. He gave that gift to us, but when we choose to ignore His word, His desires for us, we end up missing the path. We end up on the side, or skewed, or even going backwards. Right? Now we have a Bishop Mark's approach to leadership is more down to earth, less up in the clouds, less pretentious than some mainstream pastors. Last Supper, and we do feet washing. Feet washing? Feet washing. Yeah, stay away from mine. You might get knocked over. Just had to clean feet when you come. <laughs> yeah. Please, please make sure your feet are cleaned somewhat properly before you get here. I know that it's feet washing, but it's not feet cleansing. We're not, we're not doing pedicures and, and, and all that. It's just a simple wash. It's, it's, it's a symbol here. Yes. Don't make me get the Lysol out, please. <laughs> Uh, so for, be Friday, sure of course, Friday is I, what I consider the holiest day of the year. It's the most somber Christian day of the year. It is also, I think, the best and most righteous day of the year. It's, it's the day that Jesus Christ was tried and died for our sins. And um, our service will be, hopefully, if I can get this thing right, I'm really hoping that that's, that's the service. I, I really like doing Good Friday service. I know it sounds almost morbid, but it's amazing to to sit there and, and, and reenact part of it where you scream crucify him because we do that every day without saying the words mm -hmm. um, so that's a big one for me I hope you all can make it on Friday <coughs> Sunday, Sunday's Easter and it's a wonderful day and we're going to have a wonderful potluck we're going to relax a little bit after that and I'm going to go on vacation so anything else you want to hit me with guys before I go okay hang around have some fellowship you know, we call this Holy Week, um, and most people call this Holy Week, this Happy Week, and it is. It's, a, it's the most solemn, solemn week of the church year. But kind of in, in humor, a lot of the, the preachers and, and pastors and priests in the world call it Hell Week because it is. It's it's a lot of work. Um, 
for me personally, I did uh, we did four four services in, in one week. So we had last Sunday, we had Palm Sunday, and then we had Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and then today. And we also have our own lives besides that. So um, you know, it's, it was kind of like doing a month's worth of service in one week, and it was you know four four programs, four preparations, four music preparations, four communions, and then you added some foot feet washing and some, some people dying and people being put in a tomb, and it's just craziness. I tell you, it's it's nuts, but. It's all worth it. And, um... His congregation seems to thrive on his often in your face, honest, and interactive approach to teaching. Yeah. All right. One of the things that I really like is personally the fact that I'm actually part of a new and upcoming church. Mm -hmm. I think that's a real blessing because the fact that I actually get to see it just starting from the ground up, which is really, really cool. And I think you made wonderful progress as far as. Um, the sermons and everything like that. You've done a magnificent job on preparation. Thank you. And I know that wasn't easy, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> but while it's hurting. <laughs> uh, but um, I think it's a wonderful thing that we're all here and a lot more people turned out than I originally thought was going to turn out. So that's really, really cool. And I'm very grateful for that. And for those of you who are new, I would like to welcome you to our church and say thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Gavin. It is wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Gavin's, our, Gavin's been named our usher, so he's our official usher, so that's his position. <laughs> I think he does a great job, at it. He's got yeah, the gift of gab for sure, so he can definitely get the people in the, in, in the seats. And are you saying I talk a lot? Just My a little. God. No. It's all a good thing. It's all a good thing. All right. uh, I, last Friday, my my favorite, and it's going to sound almost morbid, my favorite day of the church year is Good Friday. Um, and because it's just I, the, the entire sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us uh, comes to light. And I, I, we had a group that was here last Friday, and it was kind of our, our normal core group, our, our young, young guys that have helped us start this church. And I don't think it really hit home what, what that day meant until we got toward the end of our service and, and spoke basically in lay terms. We weren't just reading from the Bible. We just kind of said, look, this is, this is a man. And he's going to die, and he's going to be beaten, and he's going to hurt, and he's going to suffer. All of that for each and every one of us in this room. And it's still, I mean, I get goosebumps thinking about it, um, because I, I think it, it took me really living my life, I and mean, I've gone to church all my life, and done services all my life, and never felt <laughs> that, never understood that. And there comes a point in your life where you go, he was just like me, and, but he was chosen to to die for us and to suffer and thank God rose rose from the dead on the third day and today we celebrate that Easter Sunday. Good. You're doing great. Oh, thank you. Though the bishop is clear that all are welcome to join his church and be baptized and celebrate communion. The church, of course, is still deeply rooted and anchored in the Christian faith. The bishop tells his followers and potential congregants to come. Listen, take what you can use from it with you and leave the rest. Stressing that it's the message and the lesson that is truly important, not necessarily who the story is about or who teaches it. Believing in the theory that all paths lead to God, which can be in direct opposition of most Christian churches, can cause some controversy. I now bestow upon you Ronnie Dwayne Edwards, a certificate commemorating this day, March the 28th, 2017, the day of your baptism. Well, that's it. Congratulations. I'll take that from you. Are you supposed to clap or no? You can clap. Yeah. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Welcome. Congratulations. Thank you. Their resurrection faith was dawning. It seems incredible that followers of Jesus did not expect him to come out of the tomb alive. After all, he had told them many times that he would be raised from the dead. Early in his ministry, Jesus said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And after his resurrection, the disciples remembered that he had said this. And his enemies remembered it too. Anything about the service, about the scripture today, anything about... Jesus Christ rising from the dead. I mean, this is a crazy notion. There's this man. What do you think about this? You go to this guy's funeral, if you will. You put him in a tomb. You roll the tomb closed. I'm sure many of you have been to funerals. 
that's pretty much it. You know, you walk away and then you have a place to go and visit and put flowers, you know, whenever you want to go see them or remember them. But this time you have this people going to this tomb and there's no body there. The body is gone. It's rather morbid. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about his body been sitting in this tomb for three days. The stench alone would, would probably knock you out. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, it's, I mean, it's just the, the human nature. I mean, and I mean, I would be scared to death at that point, seeing this this body's gone. And people are saying he rose from the dead. Was he a ghost? Is he a zombie? What the hell is it? You know. <laughs> um, so, does anybody have any 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 insight on that? How you feel about? The fact that there's this, that Jesus Christ just rose from the dead. He's uh, walking around with wounds in his hands and in his side, and he's walking and breathing and talking to us. But then it's very vague as to what he means by it, right? Mm -hmm. He says, "The only way to God is through me." Really? And we discussed this last week. We said, "We said Scott over here is not Christian. He's he's a Buddhist, right?" So, because God, because Jesus Christ says the only way through God to God is through Him, does that mean God's going to hell? And what did we all come up with last week? Yeah. Okay, why did we come up with that? Because basically what we originally said was that I believe, considering how much good Scott does and everything like that, that all paths lead to God. Important, that's the phrase I'm looking for. All paths lead to God. We can be living, those people can be living Christ-like lives. I believe Scott lives a Christ-like life, uh, for the most part. I mean, I think we all lead in our way a Christ-like life. And we all, we're all sinners as well. I was about to say. But, no, no, don't get me wrong, we're all sinners. Uh -huh. And that's, that's a given. But I think for the most part, we all lead good Christ-like lives, even though we may not call it that, we may call, we may not ever say that we are Christ-like or that Christ is our Savior. Or, but I think that that what, what the sermon was trying to say today was the fact that you don't have to necessarily say the words because God is not going to exclude. <coughs> God is not going to discriminate against you. Did you lead a good life? Did you do as maybe Christ would have done? Did you lead a life that you knew what right from wrong? Because we all know right from wrong. I think that's inherent. Mm -hmm. Did you do that? Well, yeah, but because you didn't say the words, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Because you didn't say those words, you're going to hell. Does that sound like what, what your God, what my God, what our, the God we speak of every Sunday would, would do? I don't think so. As a college student once told me, my parents are good people. But because they aren't Christians, if they were to die tomorrow, they would go to hell along with other good people like Buddha and the Dalai Lama. Now the problem in today's reading emerges in John 14, verse 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How often have people been brutalized by the church? <coughs> Historically, and especially in recent times, this passage has been used as both a carrot and a stick. It charts out a way to salvation. From this perspective, doubters, seekers, and faithful adherents of other faith traditions are ultimately doomed unless they explicitly accept Jesus as Savior. Anyone who stands outside these requirements is destined to damnation. This passage becomes the antithesis to the greater things God imagines for it when we interpret it individualistically, exclusively, and literally. Imagination is stunted and the gifts of the Spirit wither on the vine. Moreover, this passage can be theologically destructive if taken out of the context of John's Gospel and a holistic understanding of Jesus' life and message. Jesus' ministry was grounded in relationship rather than creed or theological litmus test. Follow the way of Jesus brings joy and salvation. Jesus' way, however, is not a demand, but a graceful invitation. Jesus barred no one from the path of salvation. Jesus is the way to salvation in an inclusive way. All paths of salvation and enlightenment are grounded in the graceful energy of God. 
We walk the pathway to many mansions in many diverse ways, lured by God's moment-to-moment -moment inspiration. We can, we can still speak of Jesus as supreme without denigrating other faiths and casting doubt on people's eternal destinies. We can understand Jesus' pathways and embracing grace that animates and empowers all authentic paths. We can be confessional pluralists, recognizing that the diversity of spiritual paths is not a fall from grace, but a reflection of God's personal relationship with every culture and person. Christ is the way that includes all authentic ways, enabling all ways to be fruitful. When we interpret John 14, 6 imaginatively and inclusively, then it becomes our fourth promise. <coughs> God guides us on the pathway wherever we are on our journey. God's energy enlightens all persons in all cultures, makes a way where there is no way, and leads all creation in all of its diversity to wholeness. The bishop thinks that his point on the topic is so important that he deviates from the scripted service, something rarely done, and jumps into a sort of impromptu, premature, valuable discussion. Anybody catch any of that? Good. Did you catch any of that? Yeah. Did you? Yeah, I was listening over there. It spoke about how God's diversity is essentially, as hard as it may be, like the whole idea of if Buddha, if the Dalai Lama doesn't, isn't a Christianity, they're going to hell, and this actually becomes one of the, one of the, I guess, the, Theses or whatever the the whole idea of people having any problems with it. So what is it? What is it saying though about that? It's saying that God is basically diverse, and that no matter what, I think personally, in my belief, that I think it's saying that if you're good and you're honest and you're true, then yes, you're going to go to heaven. What did, what did I just say? In the, what did I say about that? What do you, how did we come across with that? I mean, basically, you're saying the same thing I said, but. What did I say? I said that, that God is the, the, the paths, all paths lead to God. Yes. So by saying God, that Jesus Christ never, ever discriminated against people and said, look, you can't come. Yeah. You know, you're not allowed to. He did say, through me, but you have to read it creatively, if you will. Like it says, you've got to be, you to understand that God is an all-inclusive God. And I think it's ridiculous for, that, that for us to possibly think that God would take people who are genuinely good people and and damn them to hell based on the fact that they don't say the words when in fact they followed the way of Christ to begin with. Just because they said they didn't say they did, just because they didn't say the words, they were leading Christ-like lives, right? Exactly. I think that's right. an important thing. This is what we talked about last week in our in our session after service. It's that's that's why it's so I really wanted to get this across to everybody. I don't think y'all got it last week. What we were trying to get, what we we're trying to say. It's very important to understand. We don't take we, the, the Christianity is not discriminatory. Christianity does not judge. It's not our place to look at the Buddhists and the Jews and and and, and, the, and Islam and 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 say, look, you're sinners. You don't believe in Jesus. You don't say Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Therefore, you're going to hell. First of all, that's not our place to say that. Mm -hmm. Even though many Christians feel that it is, uh, God is the only one to make that decision. But we are to accept these people and teach them if they don't know, if they're not living it, how to walk with Christ, how to walk like Christ. And sometimes you don't even have to say the words, you just have to walk the walk, right? Okay. Actions speak louder than words. Absolutely, and that's part of our uh, our church's uh, saying, isn't it? Non diligamus verbo nec lingua sed in opere et veritate, right? If you, don't know what I said, if you don't know what I said, go look at the church website because it says it on there what it is. You should know that. Okay? Here. Mark? You may be a priest, but tell me what it says because you know better. It, it, I'll tell you what it says in a nutshell. It says basically, actions speak louder than words. That's okay. what it says. It says basically, walk the walk, don't just talk the talk. Your talk is nothing. Hell. You Do you believe in hell? No, I don't believe that that actual place exists, but I think that. I think we'll probably go to our own personal hill. Well, that's hell. 
I, I don't believe it exists in the way that it's portrayed. It's a, the, the reason it's portrayed that way, obviously, is what I told you. Yeah. They want you to realize that it's unimaginable pain. Yeah. And that's yeah. about, that's where they could probably describe it. I don't know like from. how you can feel pain when you're just so and so doesn't have like... Like Souls feel pain. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. You have pain. That's where all of your emotions come from. Oh, well, they come from our like. Well, you mean way. emotional pain? Emotions. Emotional pain. I absolutely I see that. do. But but I'm not, not, physical pain. How do you describe yeah, emotional pain without describing it physically? How do you describe emotional pain without describing it physically? Uh, Tell me. My headache. Um, exactly. You you have to equate the two because we don't understand our souls completely. We don't understand the thing that's dwelling inside of us. If Jesus came back today and did these things that he did back in 2,000 years ago and claimed to be the Son of God and performed these miracles on the street, what would we do? And anyone to deny it. Hmm? <laughs> Most people would find anyone to deny it. Mm-hmm. Anything, that, where's, the, where's the strings? Where's the rope? Where's the hidden cameras? This it was just on, you know, just, you know is this a television show? Is this the Carbonaro effect? You know, is this some TV show you're trying to catch to, 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 to catch us on? You know, or this man's blasphemous. He's crazy. Put him in Parkland. <laughs> <laughs> right? Think about it. We would do the same thing today we did to them then. To, did to him then. The exact same thing. I can't imagine that I wouldn't. I mean, I would think the same things. This man, Jesus Christ. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. So am I. And so am I, and so are you. I challenge you to take God with you everywhere you go. And then may the people whose lives interact with yours know that there is something different and special about you. Different because you look and act like a child of God. All in all, the Most Reverend Mark D. Manning wants nothing more than for his congregation to grow in love and to be better people, following not necessarily the interpreted word of God, but the actual words that God speaks to each of his followers through the simple act of prayer. He wants his congregation to live a more selfless life as men and women for others, believing that God will ultimately provide. He's down to earth, honest, and unfiltered and has been known to ruffle a few feathers, especially those of the religious right. All in all, he wants people to meet and understand his God, an all-inclusive, all-loving, all-powerful God who governs fairly and is approachable rather than the lofty, distant God of his youth. I think now that we move past Lent and the introspective time of of thinking about ourselves and really working on our own sins and working on ourselves to grow. During this next week, we need to go outward. Let's bloom a little bit. Let's bloom like the Easter lilies, the Easter lilies did, not Easter lilies, Easter lilies. And try and exude our ability to be men and women for others. Let's try and be this week more observant of the needs of others um, and give what we can to them in whatever way we can. I don't mean you have to give money or anything else. Just sometimes you're walking down the street and someone just says hello or hey, hey, what's up? That can change the life of a person uh, who who knows what those people are thinking at that point. They may have been having the most horrible day of their lives and you just save them from jumping off that bridge. I know that sounds extraordinary, but it has happened. Those times is when Jesus Christ works through us, and we don't even necessarily know it, but by continuing to do the acts of uh, working, being being there for others, being men and women for others, which I consider a cornerstone of this church, being men and women for others, we then open ourselves up to be done for. God will provide for us, God always has and always will. And by giving of ourselves and of our means and of our abilities and of whatever we have to give, whatever He's given us, our gift to give, then we are ourselves up to receive what we need to receive. Not what we, what we want to receive, and what we need to receive are two different things. Sometimes the same, but very often very, very different. 
So, during the next week, let's concentrate on being men and women for others. The Most Reverend Mark D. Manning, Bishop of Dallas Universal Life Church. Bishop, pastor, reverend, friend. Controversial, imperfect, honest, caring but stern, generous to a fault, stubborn, filled with emotion, spiritual, a man of God, a man for others. If you have found freedom, take it with you in the world. If you have found comfort, go and share it with others. If you have dreamed dreams, help one another that they may come true. If you have known love and unity, give some back to a bruised and hurting world in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Go now in peace to love and serve God. Amen. Bring somebody to church next Sunday. It's Dallas County. Please bring somebody to church. Get out. Get out, get out, get out.